Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and my van. It looks like we're ready for the third installment of my Life as a Poet reading series today. Um, this trip is going to take us to downtown Newark, to the Rutgers University Newark MFA programs, Writers at Newark reading series. Uh, today we are going to be seeing a reading from uh, Mider Vang, who wrote the book Afterland, which is about um, the Mong peeps. <coughs> and we're also going to be looking at a couple of pieces from Colson Whitehead, the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Underground Railroad. Um, depending on what program you're in for either undergrad or graduate school and a creative writing program, or even just other colleges in general, you should always check to see what events are going on. Sometimes they do have these series where writers come in and talk about their work and give a reading. Sometimes some of the institutions give workshops and such. And there are even events where the students in the program read. Like at Rutgers Nork, we have three reading series. We have the reading series for the first year graduate students, um, the reading series for the second year graduate students, and then we have the Writers at Nork reading series where like professional, profound poets come in. Um, also, if you wanted to check out my first year reading series, I'll put it up right here. Uh, that was on the Rutgers campus as well. I'm gonna film my second year reading series uh, that ha that's happening on March 24th. That's going to be at KGB in New York City. So if you are a New York resident and you are in NYC, hit me up closer to that time or like drop a comment down below and I can give you the directions to get to KGB and we could actually meet. Cool? Um, so yeah, we're gonna go down now. Uh, I'm gonna show you the venue and stuff and then I'll have a couple of clips of the reading and then you guys could tell me what you think. Bye. So these are the important things that I talk about in terms of like poetry community or literary community and it's going to these readings so you can get a sense of the energy that these writers are putting out and you get to be involved in this craft so it's not only someone that's writing something for an audience it's the audience actually receiving it. Um, these are awesome events because you get to ask your own questions if there are Q&A's at the end which I think are as great as actually attending a workshop because you actually get to get into the mind of those writers and those questions could be as simple as why did you choose to write this or why did you choose to put a book in this order or more specific questions on context. You could also see some of these people smiling. That's because I'm their professors walking around with the camera. <laughs> I actually, that's my contemporary American lit class and those students are allowed to come to these readings as extra credit for their coursework. It's also a good way to kind of force them into this this community and a lot of them actually start going to these events because they genuinely like them. So you see here there's a bunch of MFAs, other people at the university, as well as community members and undergraduate students. So think, tell me what you think about the q and I'd like to see what your thoughts were on this kind of stuff and have fun. Tonight we welcome Pulitzer Prize winning writer Colson Whitehead as we celebrate the release of the paperback version of the Underground Railroad. We welcome Mider Vang, winner of the Walt Whitman Award for her first book, Afterlife. Dear Soldier of the Secret War, Laos 1975. You once felt the American hand that blew its breath to drive the fire. Now they've ended the war. The American has gone home. Your Hmong village is a graveyard. Do you think of your missing wife, how the patet Lao dragged her naked, screaming and bleeding by her long black hair deep into forest shadows? Or your son's head in the rice powder shell crumble? And your brother, the youngest who followed you into combat, it was scalpel that day, they captured you both, they sliced off and boiled his tongue, forced it down her throat. Do you think of the American returning to the coffee cup? New linens in a warm bed, pulling into the driveway. Sorry about your mountains, they say. Here is the last of the ammunition, a few cases of grenades. Do you picture him reading the morning paper, turning on the nightly news? Maybe you clench your rifle closer, sling your elegies to your back, hold them as a newborn baby. You will wait for hours 
in ragged fatigues, with others abandoned, swarming the dirt runway, shoving toward the locked aircraft door among the scattered shoes, shirts, blouses, suitcases thrown out. What grief song erupts when you see the last American plane take off distant above Nongyang? How loud do you beg in your gut? pleading to some invented god or ancestor or politician, all of our thousands who died on your side, why won't you authorize another play? Please join me in welcoming Colson White. coming out. I usually spend Tuesday nights at home in my apartment weeping over my regrets. Nice <laughs> <laughs> um, so I first had the idea for the book uh, now 18 years ago. I was sitting on the couch um, in my apartment and came across a reference to the beginning on Bow Road. I remembered how when I was a little kid and first heard those words, so evocative, I thought it was a literal subway beneath the earth, which is very impractical. You know, the subway in New York is seven miles long, and we can barely keep that going. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I thought that day, wouldn't that be just a weird idea for a novel to make this metaphor into something real? The music stopped, the circle broke. Sometimes a slave will be lost in a brief eddy of liberation, in the sway of a sudden reverie among the furrows or while untangling the mysteries of an early morning dream in the middle of a song on a warm Sunday night. Then it comes always, the overseer's cry, the call to work, the shadow of the master, the reminder that she's only a human being for a tiny moment across the eternity of her servitude. The Randall brothers had emerged from the great house and were among them. The slaves stepped aside, making calculations of what distance represented the right proportion of fear and respect. Godfrey, James's houseboy, held up a lantern. According to old jockey, James favored the mother, stout as a barrel and just as firm in countenance, and Terence took after the father, tall and owl-faced, perpetually on the verge of swooping down on prey. In, in addition to the lamb, they inherited, the, inherited their father's tailor, who arrived once a month in his rickety carriage with his samples of linen and cotton. The brothers dressed alike when they were children, and continued to do so into manhood. Their white trousers and shirts were as clean as the laundry girl's hands could make them, and the orange glow of the lantern made the men look like ghosts emerging from the dark. Master James, Jockey said. His good hand gripped the arm of his chair as if to rise. Master Terence. Don't let us disturb you, Terence said. My brother and I were discussing business and heard the music. I told him, now that is the most god-awful racket I've ever heard. Yeah, and a representation, like, in terms of, like, the literature, American letters, letters today, like, how is how it's being perceived, like, what to write, who to yeah. write for, like, how to navigate that question as being one of those first folks to create those conversations in, 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 like, in this part of the world. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not easy, mm. I mean, to, to, to think that you're doing something that uh, really um, hasn't been done before. Um, and to know that um, you know what you're doing now, it does not negate everything that was, came before you. It doesn't negate the fact that you did have a rich oral tradition that still is thriving today. But that, um, you know, you know as, as someone who grew up here in this country as a refugee kid um, and having the, the exposure to English and the language, growing up with parents who didn't speak English too, and then you know going to public school here in this, you know, in, in this country, I didn't find any more writers. Mm. I couldn't find people I could relate to. I didn't find uh, Hmong poets even. I didn't even know if Hmong poets existed. Mm. Um, and so I think that that has always sort of stayed with me. It's just this huge gap in 
this part of American history that's been sort of erased. The you know the, the want to sort of ignore what happened in Laos. And so um, part of my charge, I guess, is the way that I've been thinking about a lot of my work is, well, what what are the voices that are missing from American literature? You know, where uh, wh where what communities um, are not being heard? And and I and I I think that that sort of underscores the craft too. What's not being done? You know, mm -hmm. um, and and I feel like those are the questions that have been with me as I. Um, as I wrote these poems and, and as I continue to write. Um, what ways was it more difficult to access that past in this book than the last one? Sure, the question's, the question's about, uh, um, thanks for it, it's about this book and John Henry Day, which also deals with black history, uh, is there overlap, you know, some, uh, some kind of continuity. Um, you know, they feel very different. You know, people have, said, have asked me, you write about trains a lot, and I do. I do, right? Uh, yeah, there's trains and John Henry days and trains in this one. I'm like, they seem pretty different. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, John Henry days, I was thinking about connectivity, the transatlantic railroad connecting the country, and the comparing it to the information age and the superhighway connecting America. Um, and this one, you know, I spent as little time in the tunnels as possible. Okay? You know, I really try to go, the stations are really portals to get core from this state, from this state to the next state. And um, I, know, I, mean, I think they feel very different, and I, I feel very different in terms of narrative voice. Uh, John Henry Day is very expansive, has like an encyclopedic, very maximal um, urge. And then um, when I was writing this one, I think the virtue was waiting, was that it was finding the right voice for it. And, and for me, for this book, this book for me is very concise. Um, and there are different sections where I was like, oh, if I wrote this 10 years ago, I would have like, who made the tunnels, and who was the engineer, and who was the architect? Um, with the museum section, you know, it came out and there's two pages like, oh, actually I'm done, but old Colson would have been like, who's the curator, postmodern jiu-jitsu? So, um, <laughs> so the experience of writing the book, book was very different. Um, I think John Henry Day's was my second book, it was very long, I was like, can I do this? And with this one, um, I have to wait for 14 years, and I, Probably did. Both of you arrived at your final products. If you tried out different mixtures of that, um, how you knew that you had arrived at the right way to tell these stories? Um, I, I feel like for me, I'm still trying to figure that out. You know? um, I think it's ongoing for me. Um, when I was writing the poems, there was this sort of like trend where I would write a poem and in six months down the line, I could see how that could be better, you know? Um, and every six months I was seeing something different. So if I waited six months, then I'd figure out what to do, right? Um, but, um, but, but you know, for me, like I, I, I don't know that I actually decided that I wanted to, to write the poems the way that I, that I did. I, don't recall that I ever made a definitive decision, but it just kind of happened, mm. you know? Like, I think there was one point where I was like, oh, I can do that, mm. you know? I can do that, and um, it was just uh, like, a, like a little breakthrough that I had, that uh, there's actually one poem in the, in the collection where I tried that, and I you know, wasn't sure what, like, you know, for, for a poet who, for someone who also writes essays, you know, and wants to also be literal, and wants to explain everything, and wants to make sure you get it, and wants to, be clear, it was very hard to let go of the anxiety of just clarity and just be okay with, with you know, um, writing in a way that was not always very clear to myself even. And so um, I feel like it's not a good enough answer. Maybe Wilson might have a better one. It just kind of happened. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel, everyone. Today we are going to be talking about the enjambment. 